Are you open to being surprised by God? God loves to surprise his children, you know. So often we are going along our merry way in our mundane routine. Suddenly, God shows up unexpectedly, and God does something in our lives. We think, for example, of Moses. There he is tending his flock, and suddenly he hears, Moses, Moses, take off the shoes from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. You're going somewhere. You are pursuing some objective, and then you're knocked over. You didn't see it coming, and you hear the words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, this is the desire of every pastor. Every Sunday when we gather, we want God to show up, right, to surprise us, to impart his wisdom and his grace in our lives. And this morning, we'll look at one of the greatest examples of all time, the vision of Isaiah, the moment when God called the prophet into his presence to reveal his splendor and beauty, to give him a vision that changed his life, indeed changed the course of history. That's our topic this morning, a sermon titled, The Vision That Changes Everything. We begin in chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, the death of Uzziah was a turning point in Israel's history. During his 52 years as king, the nation enjoyed relative peace and prosperity. She was, for the most part, faithful to Yahweh. But when he died, things changed. Under his son, the next king, Jotham, and then even more so under Ahaz, the wicked king, the leadership of Israel turned their backs on God. And with the light of God's presence behind them, they proceeded to walk in the darkness of their own shadow. And it was there in that shadow of self-sufficiency and rebellion that life fell apart. Economically, socially, politically, and most of all, spiritually. And if we were to summarize the problem, we would have to point to idolatry. The Israelites were running after the gods of the nations. She was enamored with the life of these pagans around her, and she was experiencing what Greg Beale described so well when he said these words, what we revere, we resemble, either for restoration or for ruin. Isn't that right? That thing, that object on which we set our affections, it shapes us. It makes us into something. And so if we're looking at an idol to provide us with life, then our hearts become hard and our ears become dull and we can no longer see. Well, in the face of this idolatry, God reveals himself to the prophet. We continue in verse 1. The Lord was sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, these opening verses, verses 1 through 4, are like a canvas on which the Spirit lays down brushstrokes to portray who He is, who God is, and who He's like. And in these verses, we have a number of of significant images. We see, for example, the robe. Now, in the ancient world, the robe that was worn by a king said something about his power and authority. If you were the king of a small nation, then you would probably be seen wearing a modest-sized robe. But if you were the king of a great nation like Tyre or Sidon or Egypt or perhaps Israel under Solomon's reign, then you would have a robe that was exceedingly long and intricately decorated. Well, notice what it says of God's robe. It fills the entire temple. Well, what do we know about temples? Well, temples in the ancient world were often understood to be microcosmic models of the universe. Let me explain. Think of the Jewish temple, for example. Three basic sections, right? The place where you, as a faithful Jew, would stand with outstretched arms and worship the Lord. But then you had 
the precinct of the priests, a place that you could see with the visible eye, but you could not go there if you were not a Levitical priest. And then you had the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, that place where God manifested his presence. And you couldn't even see into that area because it was separated by a great big curtain. Now, these three precincts were thought to correspond to the three dimensions of the universe. The earth, where you stand with outstretched arms and you worship. The sky, a place you could see, but in a day before airplanes, you could not access. And then finally, the third dimension, the spiritual realm, the place where God manifests his presence, where angels sing, where there are all other sorts of spiritual entities. And so with that in mind, think with me for a moment, what does it mean to say that the robe representing God's authority and strength fills the temple representing the entire universe? See, there is no place in all of creation that God does not exercise complete and perfect sovereignty. That's the idea. All of these images are coming together to make that point. And so verse 2, similarly, above him there stood seraphim, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. This is the only place in Scripture where we read about these creatures, these so-called fiery ones, and they have three sets of wings. With the first set, they cover their face. Presumably, the light emanating from God is so bright that they cannot look directly upon him. With the second set of wings, they cover their feet, an act of humility and modesty. They are the creatures. God alone is the creator. And then you have the third set of wings with which they fly, always ready to go forth in service of this great God. And what are they doing? They're singing. Verse 3, they're calling out one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Imagine the scene. Try to picture this throne room, the highest court in all of the universe. And I, I envision these angels singing back and forth antiphonally. And they're creating this crescendo, holy, holy, holy. And what they say is mind blowing. The whole earth is full of his glory. This was a radical notion. I mean, it's very familiar to us. We have 2,000 years of church history with confessions and creeds that affirm the universality of God. But in the ancient world, the belief was that a deity exercised some authority within a particular geographic area. So you had the god of Edom and the gods of, of Moab and so forth. But the idea that there's one god whose strength and whose authority transcends geographic boundaries was unheard of, except for Israel's God, because he is the one true God. Verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. I wonder, what comes to your mind as you hear these words? I think of Exodus 19. Remember God at Sinai when he appeared among his people? And the the mountain trembled, and it's described there as a furnace with all of the smoke that rose to heaven. This is what happens when the holy God appears, when he shows up. So what is the main idea? Majesty, holiness, a power and authority that transcends our comprehension. Why is this relevant for us? After all, we're not idolaters, right? We're not like those ancient peoples who would carve a piece of wood and then bow down before it. Well, maybe we are idolaters. I'll never forget my Old Testament professor, Doug Stewart, when I was at seminary, stood before us, and he said, I guarantee that if you lived in the ancient world Apart from God's grace, all of you would be card-carrying idolaters. And then he went on to explain why that was the case. I'm going to give you a few of those reasons. I have relayed all of Professor Stewart's reasons in an article that we posted on our website this week. You can get the, the full lesson there. But here are just a few examples, a few reasons. 
First, idolatry was expedient. You expected something in return for your offering. Fertility of animals and crops and victory over your political enemies. And so you expected God to work on your behalf. That's what motivated the whole enterprise. Second, it was accessible. You could have an idol in your home or at work, or you can even carry one with you. Uh, This statue or the painting of the god was thought to reflect the presence of the deity. Now, the ancients weren't so naive or ignorant to think that this piece of wood they just carved has suddenly become divine. No, it's a little bit like voodoo, you know. There's an emblem, there's an icon, there's a symbol that's tangible. And standing above and beyond that, there was thought to be this spiritual force that they worshipped. It was accessible. It was easy. There were no ethical demands connected to pagan worship. No covenant obligations such as what we see in the Mosaic Law, the purity laws and caring for your neighbor and this sort of thing. In pagan idolatry, your only obligation was to bring food. Why? Why do you suppose that is? Well, humans were inferior to the gods in every way except that gods, it was believed, they could not feed themselves. They relied on worshipers to come and bring food through the sacrificial Uh, system through the precincts of animal sacrifice. And so that was sort of the leverage you had on the deity, the food that you brought. It was normal throughout the entire ancient Near East. Idolatry was practiced, and it seemed to be effective. I mean, look at the great superpowers of the day, the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Egyptians. They were all pagan idolaters. And then it was sensual. In the pagan worldview, When deities procreated, a bountiful harvest would follow. There was blessing to be had. So temple prostitutes were employed to promote sexual activity as an example for the gods to follow. That's the logic, see? That's how it worked. Well, at this point, Professor Stewart stood before us, and he said, now let's think about this problem of idolatry. And here's what he said. These are my words, but his idea. He said, when you look at it closely, you see the real object of worship here was not the God or the gods, it was the self. It was the gratification and service of our selfish desires, a problem that is just as modern as it was ancient. Does that ring true for you? Isn't this where we live? I mean, just think about these features once once again, expedient, accessible, easy, normal, sensual. Just consider our devices. I mean, just think for a moment about our smartphone and the way in which it potentially mediates all of these different experiences. It's where we live, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. So if we have temple prostitution on one side of the spectrum, and we have the Isaiah 6 vision of worshiping God on the other side, with the living God at the very center of things, how can we move closer to the biblical vision? How can we encounter the living God? Well, I'd like to suggest an answer that is profoundly countercultural. It is, in fact, countercultural in the church, as it turns out. I believe it starts right here with Sunday morning worship. When the people of God, the body of Christ, who are bound together in spiritual union, assemble to worship the one true God. I think that's where it starts. That we we come here and we raise our sights above the horizon with all of the noise and distraction of this world and we look by faith to the living God as he appears to us through his word, and we sing to him, and we listen to his word, we ascribe to him the supreme worth that he alone deserves. That's what we're doing here. And everything that we plan for on a Sunday is aimed at that goal, see. It's the reason, for example, why we don't have screens here. Now, we don't want to be legalistic or snooty about it, but think about it. When you look at a screen, what are you doing? You're a consumer in that moment. You're receiving uh, entertainment or some form of education, and that's all well and good. 
But what we're trying to do now together in worship is to encounter in an unmediated way the living God who comes to us by His Spirit So there's something very special, something very transcendent going on here. And the idea is this, we do it every week, the first day of the week, and hopefully we're putting the bar here as it relates to God-centered worship so that we can come from this place into the various places where we live. And all of us as individuals then can hopefully approach God in that same biblically chaste, God-centered, transcendent way. So that moms and dads around the breakfast table are able to lift the sights of their children and recognize the glory of this God. Hmm? Well, what happens when we lean into this kind of worship? Verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What is he saying here, woe is me? Well, this is a way to invoke upon yourself a curse. Where I come from in New York, we have a Yiddish phrase that we often use, oy vey. We don't use it as much around here, but that's simply the Yiddish translation of this Hebrew, oy vey. It's a way to say, I now would like to crawl into a little hole and die. You know, that's the idea. Isaiah is very much at the end of himself. And why is this the case? Because of his lips. Well, what's wrong with his lips? Well, lips, you'll recall, are a barometer indicating the condition of the heart, right? Out of the overflow of the the heart, the mouth speaks. One day, all of us will give an account for the words we have spoken. And this is a problem that's not limited to Isaiah, but all people struggle with this. In other words, it's a way to say, I'm a sinner. I am guilty before God. Listen to me, I bear testimony to that fact in the way I speak. This beatific vision humbled Moses. It caused Daniel to fall down prostrate. It blinded Saul. It threw John the apostle upon his face. And here it brings Isaiah to the brink of death. So what's going on? In a word, it is humility. That's what it is, a proper estimation of ourselves before this living God. Uh, The world encourages us to become bigger and greater, uh, to fan into flame our own glory, to do what we can to expand our platform so that all of us as individuals will be memorable, right? That's the world in which we live. What a different vision that is from what we see here. The Christian faith, as illustrated by Isaiah and virtually every other figure in the Bible, has a very different trajectory. It's downward. It is the kernel of wheat that Jesus describes in John 12 when he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So there is Isaiah on the brink of death, What does God do? Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Notice, who takes the initiative here? It's not Isaiah. You know, I imagine Isaiah prostrate on the ground, you know, face down. It's not the prophet pushing himself up off the floor, getting his act together and making himself presentable to God. No, nothing of the sort. It is God, by divine initiative, who goes to Isaiah by means of the angel who is carrying the coal from the altar. And notice where the coal is applied. His lips, the very place of his need, the symbol of his guilt, that thing which keeps him separated from God, see? That's where God goes to deal with that problem directly. Why does the seraph fly with the coal? Why does he not impart blood? For after all, we know that blood is the only true solvent for our sin. It's the only way to purge our guilt, 
Well, it's important to recognize that the glowing coal was drawn from the smoking altar of sacrifice where sacrificial blood had been spilled. Later in this book, Isaiah describes the reality to which this blood-drenched coal points. In chapter 53, he writes of the suffering servant of God. And here's what he says. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. See, this, my friends, is the bleeding sacrifice that purchased our redemption. What we see here in the throne room of God in, in the application of this coal is anticipating what God will do one day, the ultimate atonement that he will offer his people when Jesus, the Lamb of God, goes to the cross and there receives nails of divine judgment in his hands and his feet. Why, do you wonder, why did Jesus do that? To die the death we could never die? To pay the penalty we could never pay? to reconcile us, we who were far off and without hope in this world, to bring us into a living relationship with God so that we who are in bondage to these idols who just can't get free would have the power of that bondage broken so that we would be liberated. We who look along the horizontal plane and see no hope in sight, God did it for us so that we would have a salvation that transcends anything this world could ever come up with. When Jesus died, he removed from us our sins as far as the east is from the west. But my friends, here's the good news. Jesus did not remain in the grave. On that fateful day, that what we call Good Friday, the disciples were overwrought with sorrow because in that moment they thought it was, it was all over. There was no hope. There was nothing but darkness and despair. We will be exiled from God for all of eternity. And all we'll hear is the echo of Isaiah's words, woe is me. But that's not where it ended. Because God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raised his son Jesus from the dead. So that this Savior of whom we speak is not a dead historical figure, no. He's a living Savior who is alive even now to impart freedom and hope to every hurting heart. In this gospel, we see the compassion of God. As someone has written, our life is like the dial of a clock. The hands are God's hands passing over us. The short hand is the hand of his chastening. The long hand is his hand of mercy. Slowly and surely the hand of chastening must pass, and at each stroke God speaks his word of grace. But the hand of mercy moves constantly. With blessing sixtyfold, God covers each moment. Both hands are firmly fastened to the central pivot, which is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. So where did this leave Isaiah? Verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. The proper name for this is a call narrative. We see it in various parts of the Bible. Usually God goes directly to an individual and tells him or her what he would have them do. So we think of the burning bush, classic example. We think of Gideon or Jeremiah. But this call narrative is like virtually none other. Because we don't have God addressing Isaiah directly. No, there's just a question asked. Who will go for us? Whom shall we send? And then it's, it's sort of hanging in the air, right? And Isaiah then has the opportunity to respond, and of course he does. Here am I, he says. Send me. Now, I want to suggest this was the only reasonable response on Isaiah's part. I mean, think about it. Just a moment, he was as good as dead, without any hope. And God, in that moment, lifted him by his steadfast love, made Isaiah a new person, gave him a 
a spiritual gift that transformed him from the inside. Having had that experience, what could Isaiah possibly say in this moment except what he says? Lord, here am I. I exist for your purposes. Send me. I am eager to do whatever it is you would have me do. That's Isaiah's response. And my friends, is it any different for us? I mean, think about it. Do you remember what it was like when you were way off in a distant country without hope? Surrounded by darkness and gloom, thinking, goodness gracious, what is life all about? Here we are, we live and we die. Remember what that's like. And remember what it was like for God to reach his hand of mercy into your life and bring you out of darkness and into the light of his presence. And having had that experience now, as children of God, what can we possibly say in response to this question, who will go for us, except the same thing Isaiah said, here am I, send me. That's why I live, that's who I am. My life is yours. We're not just saved by the gospel, we're saved for the gospel, for this enterprise of embodying and proclaiming the good news. So where does this leave us? Well, I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, the wicked king Ahaz, grandson of Uzziah, he really was wicked, you know. In 732 BC, he went to Assyria to swear allegiance to Tiglash-Pileser, the king of that nation, and he was so struck by the, the, the glory of Assyria's idolatry that he returned to Jerusalem and he had a replica of the uh, altar made in the holy city. And then he modified the order of the Levitical worship to, to reflect what he had seen there in Assyria. And as though that weren't enough, he went so far as to offer his son as a sacrifice to Moloch, sending him through the fire. Hmm? Hideous abomination. But remember where we started. God likes to surprise us. God likes to step into history and do the very thing we would never expect him to do. Because after, and that is indeed what happened here, for after Ahaz, there was another king, his son, do you know what his name was? Hezekiah a man after God's own heart. He removed the defilements of his father. He brought about reformation. He once again returned the living Lord to the center of Israel's life. Well, how about you this morning? What defilements is God calling you to address? What idolatries do we need to deal with at this time? My friends, there is no better moment than now as we approach the Lord's table to recognize what Jesus has done on our behalf. That because of his death and because of his victory, we can move from our idolatries and join with the angels of heaven singing, holy, holy, holy. Let us pray. We confess, Lord, that this is what you do. You show up. You surprise us when we don't expect it. I pray that in this moment, as we approach your table, you would do just that. Amen.